it is not possible to talk about Verdi without resorting to the highest superlatives. But the crown of operatic art was not led in his cradle. His first ten years as an artist were marked by despair, sadness and lack of success. Who was Giuseppe Verdi? What people and places shaped him? A biographical approach to the century artist from Italy. Giuseppe grew up in the small hamlet of Le Roncole outside Buseto. This village is located about 20 kilometers from Parma, in the agricultural Po Plain. His parents were innkeepers and had an inn there, where the family also lived. When visiting Verdi's parental home, one is struck by the stately size of the house. By no means does it give the impression of a family poor as mice. The house has been carefully renovated and left in somewhat original condition and can be visited. Giuseppe showed early musical talent. However, in this small village there was no support for talented musicians. But he was lucky and was encouraged from an early age. His first teacher was a church musician. Here you can see a photo of the church where little Giuseppe often played the organ. After that, during his teenage years, he was encouraged by his future father-in-law Antonio Barezzi, a wealthy liquor dealer and music lover. Verdi had met and fallen in love with Barezzi's daughter Margherita during their school years in Buseto. After attending the Lyceum in Buseto, Barezzi sent Verdi to Milan. He imposed on him the completion of a music degree as a condition for marrying his daughter. However, Verdi was faced with the unbelievable. He was refused admission to the conservatory. They told him that he was too old and that his piano playing was not good enough. Verdi was shocked. His dream of a career and a family seemed to be shattered. He managed to get by in Milan for a few years with odd jobs and returned to Buseto three years later and was finally able to marry the daughter of his patron Antonio Barezzi. In short succession, Margherita gave birth to two children and Giuseppe found his private happiness in Buseto. But only two years later, disaster struck him. Illness and childbirth swept away his wife and their two small children. In this crisis, at the age of 26, he wrote his first opera, Oberto, which did not attract attention. Three years later, however, the time had come for Verdi to celebrate his first triumph with his third opera, Nabucco. The existence of the opera would have been inconceivable without the then director of La Scala, Bartolomeo Merelli. He put his trust in Verdi after the failure of his second opera and provided him with the libretto for Nabucco. Why did Merelli support Verdi so strongly? On the one hand, he believed in the young, 26-year-old Italian. And on the other hand, as impresario of La Scala, he was looking for new composers. Opera was lacking fresh blood. The situation Merelli faced was that Bellini had died a few years before, Donizetti had left for Paris and Rossini had stopped writing opera. But Verdi was far from becoming the new star of Milan's La Scala before Nabucco. He was down and out. His wife and children were dead and his first two operas were failures. He even entertained the idea of giving up the profession of composer. What followed was later described by Verdi himself. Merelli had stuffed the libretto into his coat pocket and when he arrived in his room, he threw it on the table. The booklet fell on the floor and it opened just at the place of the Va pensiero sull'ali dorate. 
Verdi's eyes fell on this passage and he was electrified. That same night, he read through the libretto and decided to write a new opera. This famous tale that Verdi had told himself is not believed by some historians. Nevertheless, it's mentioned here because Verdi deliberately cultivated various such myths for image reasons. So Nabucco became a sensational success and made Verdi suddenly famous. Even more, this work catapulted contemporary opera into a new age. Formerly, Nabucco was admittedly a conservative work in the spirit of Rossini and still adhered to the template-like structure of the Scena et Aria. But musically, it was a significant innovation. From Nabucco on, every of his operas was to have its own characteristic coloring, an individual fingerprint, the so-called Tinta Musicale. What does the Tinta Musicale of Nabucco consist of? Never before had one experienced the almost brutal and elemental power of music as in Nabucco. This manifests itself in the unusually heated role of Abigail, in the loud, brass-heavy orchestra and with the immensely present chorus. While Wagner later chose leitmotifs to structure his works, Verdi used this stylistic device. From then on, Verdi defined the Tinta Musicale of each opera in detail before he started the composition process, thus giving each of his operas an unmistakable character. In view of the sensational success of Nabucco, the impresario Merelli offered Verdi a contract for a follow-up work for La Scala. The contract was fully drawn up, with only a gap in the compensation sum. Merelli asked the composer to insert the sum he liked himself. Verdi was the new star of La Scala. This Malinese institution remained his most important artistic reference point throughout his life. It was here that his first opera, Oberto, was premiered in 1839 and it was also here that his last opera, Falstaff, was premiered 54 years later. Seven of Verdi's operas saw the light of day at La Scala, but between the premiere of Giovanna d'Arco and Otello there was a gap of 42 years, during which Verdi premiered in Venice, Rome, Naples, Cairo, Florence, Trieste and Paris. Verdi was often able to get better prices at other opera houses. But again and again the new works quickly found their way to La Scala. For Verdi, the judgment of the educated, demanding Malinese audience always remained an important yardstick. The composer always attached great importance to audience success. In addition to La Scala, another important institution was based in Milan. The offices of his lifelong publisher Ricordi were located here. During his work on Nabucco, Verdi had met the singer Giuseppina Strepoli, and the two soon became a couple. With the proceeds of Nabucco, at the age of 32, he was able to buy a respectable residence in Buseto, Palazzo Orlando, and he moved in there with Giuseppina. However, the people of Buseto did not approve of the illegitimate relationship and drove the maestro away. Verdi was deeply shocked by this hostile reaction and wanted to deal with these events with his new work. He now shifted his attention to Venice. The Lagoon City had the honor to premiere two of the three great Verdian operas of the Trilogia Popolare, the popular trilogy, at the Teatro alla Fenice, namely the Traviata and the Rigoletto. One of them became the announced fiasco and the other a surprising triumph. In between there were only two years. 
Verdi already suspected in advance that the premiere of La Traviata would end in a fiasco. The choice of a contemporary material was a tremendous sensation, because Italian opera had until then only known historical subjects. With the contemporary La Traviata, based on Alexandre Dumas' Lady of the Camellias, it had arrived in the present for the first time. Whereas up to then any kings or knights had been the villains, Verdi took the risk of making a courtesan, the heroine and holding up a mirror to Italian society. Why did Verdi choose this story? As a young man, Dumas himself had lived with Marie Duplessis, a well-known socialite. She died of consumption at the age of 25 and Dumas used her as a model for the protagonist of the novel. When he first came into contact with Dumas' novel, he was deeply moved. It reminded him of his own situation with his partner Giuseppina Strepponi. When he moved in with Giuseppina, she was already 32 years old and a woman with a past. She was not a courtesan, but had three pregnancies with different men, in addition to her professional life as an opera singer. Even in Paris, Verdi and Strepponi were harassed by posh society, and in Buceto the couple encountered open opposition from the small town population. It was particularly painful for Verdi that his former patron and promoter Barezzi openly opposed him. It is quite possible that Verdi was creating a portrait of Barezzi with the role of Germont, which he had upgraded from Dumas' original. But the Venetians also reacted irritably. The noble Venetian public did not appreciate being accused of mendacity. The Teatro La Fenice had foreseen this reaction and tried to defuse the accusation by setting the plot 150 years back in time to the Baroque era, thus making Verdi's waltz music absurd. In addition, there were casting difficulties because the opera was scheduled at short notice. Verdi had to bitterly acknowledge at the premiere that his work not only failed, but that people laughed at it. One of the reasons for the fiasco of the premiere of La Traviata could have been the corpulence of the leading actress. In the death scene of the third act, she did not give the impression of an emaciated woman and thus provoked the laughter of the audience. One newspaper critic maliciously wrote that she was as fat as a mortadella from Bologna. Rigoletto fared better in Venice and became a surprising triumph, which Verdi could even surpass with his next opera. The success of the third opera of the trilogy, Il Trovatore, was immense. Already the premiere of January 19, 1853 in Rome was acclaimed. Applause broke out after each aria and the end of the third act and the whole fourth act had to be repeated. The opera was also considered novel, despite its more traditional formal layout. In the following years, Il Trovatore was seen throughout Europe and in America. In 1862, Verdi wrote in a letter that Il Trovatore could be heard even in Africa and India. Still today, it is one of the most popular operas, but due to casting difficulties, the demand is greater than the supply. A few kilometers outside of Buceto is the stately home of Sant'Agato. Originally a farm, Verdi transformed it into a stately residence. He bought the land in 1848 and gradually extended it with the aim of retiring there at the age of 60. He lived there from 1851 until the end of his life, with his partner Giuseppina, and composed many of his works there. 
he was protected there from the hostility of his countrymen and appreciated the life as a peasant, as he called himself. Villa Verde is today an outstanding place to visit, which, although it's a museum, has been left as Verdi had left it in his will. It is cared for and maintained by his descendants and features a wide variety of exhibits, ranging from the fortepiano of, to the carriage stable and the death mask. A beautiful park invites the visitors to take a walk. A few kilometers away, in Buseto, there is a neat little theater with 300 seats. It was built during the composer's lifetime. Verdi donated 10,000 lire out of courtesy, but never entered it out of resentment against the people of Buseto. With his Simon Boccanegra, Verdi took a major step in his music dramatic conception. In his conception of music drama, he dispensed with numbers and treated each scene as a dramatic and musical unity. The orchestra gained in importance. Verdi increased its expressiveness and gave it more presence, at the expense of vocal bravura, which many a theatergoer misses in Simon Boccanegra. Verdi consistently continued on the path to musical drama that he had begun 10 years earlier with Macbeth. The failure of Simon Boccanegra pained him greatly. Thus, with Il Ballo in Maschera, a classical number opera followed as the next work. In the meantime, the Italian Revolution, the Risorgimento, had taken possession of Italy and Verdi was persuaded to run for the Chamber of Deputies. His insignia thus became a symbol of Italian unity. But this phase remained merely an interlude. Verdi was far too busy with his opera projects and he soon resigned from the post of deputy. Paris marked an important period in Verdi's life. He was often in the French capital for his opera projects. He wrote Le Verpre Sicilien and Dot Carlos for the Grand Opera and other works underwent French versions. Verdi was at times obsessed with conquering Paris and replacing Meyerbeer as the opera god in Paris. His first attempt was Le Verpre Sicilien, in which Verdi took personal and dictatorial charge of the staging cementing his reputation as a theatrical tyrant. Soon he was only called Merdi, behind closed doors by the unpunctual musicians at the opera. After Meyerbeer's death, he was commissioned to write a work for the Grand Opera during the 1867 World's Fair. He chose Don Carlo and wrote a five-act opera. The effort for the staging was gigantic. The fact alone that the theatre had to sue a staggering 355 costumes for the premiere is proof enough. He had drawn inspiration for the Spanish drama years earlier during a trip to the Escorial. He remembered the king's Spartan chamber and used it as a backdrop for Philip II's magnificent monologue scene. Verdi's relationship with the Parisians was divided. Early on he was awarded the Legion of Honor medal. However, he refused to take part in the procedure, calling it a mock, which was resented by the Parisians. Success came rather late in Paris and Verdi accepted the award of Commander of the Legion of Honor when he was over 70 years old, and even dined with Napoleon III and Eugenie at their Compagnie Chateau. Verdi had a kind of love-hate relationship with Naples. Love connected him with the Neapolitan way of life, and local French such as the libertist Camarano. Verdi had a contempt for the representatives of the kingdom who made his life difficult with their policies 
and censorship of his operas. Paradoxically, as late as 1848, Verdi, a Republican, wrote a hymn for the Neapolitan Bourbon King. Nobody knows what devil had written him there, perhaps simply Mammon. Later he came to Naples several times in winter to spare Giuseppina the winters of Buseto. When Verdi began an affair with the soprano Teresa Stolz, it led to a deep marital crisis. Eventually, Giuseppina accepted the situation and the three even spent a winter vacation together in Naples. Verdi was almost 60 years old when he wrote Aida. He wanted to retire, but was asked by the Viceroy of Egypt to write an opera for the opening of the Cairo Opera House. Verdi then, in order to turn down the request, named an outrageously high sum, which, to his surprise, was accepted. The longer he worked on it, the more enthusiastic he became, until Aida finally became, together with Otello, perhaps his greatest work. Verdi surprised the musical world twice with works for his old age. The first time at the age of 74 with the Otello and at 80 with the Falstaff. Both premieres became triumphs at La Scala. The unique position of Otello in the work of the great Italian master is connected with his consistent move towards the musical drama of a through-composed opera. And with Falstaff, he was finally able to write the comedy and was thus able to cast off Rossini's curse, who claimed that Verdi could not write comedies. In the last years of his life, Verdi initiated a generous act. He bought a large area in Milan's Piazza Buonarroti and had a retirement home built there for impoverished elderly musicians. He deliberately did not want to build a hospital-like nursing home, but a home for guests who would live in two-person rooms instead of dormitories. Since then, more than a thousand people have enjoyed this tastefully furnished boarding house, which, at Verdi's request, was opened only after his death. This place also became the last resting place of Verdi and his second wife, Giuseppina, who died a few years before him. After the death of Giuseppina, the 84-year-old had taken up residence at the Albergo Milano, now the Grand Hotel, where he died in 1901. Even today, this suite can be booked as the Giuseppe Verdi suite. It has continued to be kept as close as possible to the original decor. The hotel room has also become famous for the balcony that belongs to the room. Here, Verdi received ovations from crowds several times, most glamorously after the premiere of Otello, when the tenor of the premiere, Francesco Tamagno, accompanied him and sang areas from Otello from the balcony, to the delight of the crowd. <laughs> 